okay. top off. The top off whatever the beginning yeah. is. Okay. 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 You can also attach a file to the comments. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, today I'm, I'm going to do something that I've never done before. Uh, so uh, it's something that I've I've always what well, I've done in sort of one-on-one -on -one meetings with students trying to explain how this works, but I've never actually done it in front of a class. So, so I thought I'd make it a bit more interesting and do it as a kind of a, a pseudo improv. Uh, in the sense that you know you're all dealing with papers and you all probably have not too much knowledge about the material of the paper and you're going to have to deal with it and somehow fight with the paper and try to extract some some wisdom and some knowledge from it in order to put together a report. And of course, the question that comes up is how on earth are we going to do that? And what ex you know what exactly is this report supposed to contain? Am I just supposed to regurgitate what's in the paper? No. And you know what what is it that you want from us? And this is a, a, a natural question that you all have. And, I'm hoping that today, by essentially trying to run a demo of what it might be like to actually look at one of these papers, you might get some sense of how this is supposed to go. Now, of course, I'm cheating a little bit. I have, you know, I've seen many, many papers in my time, and, you know, and I have in the past seen the one that I'm mentioning. I have not read it in the last, I think, six years. So there's a good chance that I've forgotten everything in it. But of course, you know, given the background knowledge that I have, it's going to be probably a little bit easier for me to read these papers than it would be for you. So I'm going to try to simulate what it might be like to approach this material for the first time. And, and I, I should tell you that this happens to me every day. Right? I will take a paper in an area, uh, not every day, but every week at least. I will read a paper in an area that I know nothing about. And I have to read the paper. There's no one I can go and ask. There's no person I can say, hey, explain this paper to me. There's no one around. Right? And so I have to somehow figure out how to make sense of this paper, even without knowing any context about it. So this actually is a tool that I use all the time, even now. And that's why it's a useful skill to have in your, at your disposal. And it doesn't matter what area you happen to be interested in. You do end up having to read these papers. And so I'm going to try and do that for this paper. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a paper that appeared either in Stock or Fox, I forget, in 1998. Um, it, it, in retrospect, it turned to be an extremely important paper. At this point, I think it has something like 2,000 citations. Not that that necessarily means it's good, but it, it also is in addition to the fact that it's a good paper. It has some citation. Um, uh, and um, and 
It's a paper that could have easily been submitted for this project proposal, and you would have had to do it. And so I'm going to now walk through the different parts of what you might want to do in this book. And I, what I want, what I'm hoping to do is, I, I linked this last night, and if you have, you know, if some of you have your laptops out and you want to follow along, please do so. Um, I'm going to be, you're going to see, it's going to, it's going to be very non-linear, and that, that's normal. The first thing I'd like to do is sort of maybe just set up some notes, right? So. Um, what does your, at a more basic mechanical level, what does your project report have to have? Right, so there's the paper. So there's some paper that you're trying to review. And the first thing that you have to remember, that no paper is an island. Paraphrase. In other words, every paper exists within a context. Okay, so every, let, me, let me write that down. Okay. <coughs> And what I mean by that is that in order to understand what a paper is doing and what it's contributing, you have to understand the context. Otherwise, you will not fully understand why the paper is interesting. So what does it mean to understand the, con the context of paper? You have to know, you know, So if you think of a, if you think of research as kind of a sort of a, a, a journey, right? Sort of on this train, sort of going along, you see the sights outside. At some point, you see something interesting, and the reason it's interesting is is mostly, but not always, but mostly because of other interesting things you've seen before that make this somewhat interesting. In that sense, the paper is almost in many ways like a piece of art. Right? I mean, there's a certain context to appreciating it. You can appreciate it at a basic level just for itself, but to really get a true appreciation of the paper, you have to understand. Where, why it was interesting in the first place. So that's the first thing you have to do with the paper. You have to understand the context. And for a lot of the papers you've chosen, there is no after context, they're very recent. For a lot of the papers you some of the papers you've chosen, but not that many, there is little before context. They either have two problems or they're the first. And that's okay. Because even then, there's usually some reason as to why a problem was either studied for the first time, or there's some reason why a problem is, you know, uh, maybe ended a line of discussion. There's always some answer to that question. But you have to know that. And if you don't know that, you're not going to be able to write a report. Okay. All right. On that note, that's so. One of the first things I will do when I look at a paper of this kind, if I'm reading it, so I'm usually I'm not reading a paper for writing a report. I'm reading a paper to look at some particular lemma or try to find some key results. So I, I will read it differently. But for this purpose of trying to read a paper, I want to understand a number of things about it in the context. But the first thing, of course, we'll do is you know. Um, so I guess step one would be. What is the paper about? Okay, you should be able to answer that question. So let's go back to our paper. Okay, so this is the title: "Approximate Nearest Neighbors Towards a Ring of Crystal Neutrality." And you will find that when you read, you have to kind of ignore words. So the way you should the title is "Blah Blah Near Neighbors Blah 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 Blah," <laughs> and that's the correct way to read this paper right now. Eventually, the blah blahs will get filled, but you don't try to understand every word. This is not as a story where you're supposed to understand every word before you go to the next one. The skill in reading these kinds of technical material is knowing how to skip. Okay, so there's an abstract. Uh, sometimes I will read the abstract, sometimes I will not. Uh, I don't know, do you all like to read abstracts? When you, read, when you were searching for your project papers, were you reading the abstracts? Yes. Yes, were they helpful? Yes. They were? Okay, so let's read the abstract. <laughs> the nearest nearer problem is the following. And, yeah, I'll just read it. So it's set up, we have set up points, N, in some metric space, I have no idea what a metric space is. Do any of you know what a metric space is? Very few of you. So you would probably stop at this point and say, you know, <laughs> and say, oh, uh, metric space. Okay, Wikipedia, let me go to Wikipedia. Blah, blah, blah. Ooh, hyperbolic geometry, what's that? <laughs> and suddenly you're lost. You're, you're doomed. <laughs> Three hours later, you suddenly realize you have no further clue about this paper. <laughs> I only know this because I do it. <laughs> Don't worry about a metric spaces. If you need to know it, it will come up. So, so let's go back to our paper. A given set of points in some blah blah blah. Three persons the points to efficiently answer queries. Stop me if there are words here that are not making sense to you. Because again, I have, you know, I have 
I have too much background to do a true improv, so you should stop me with the things that don't make sense. If you know, if any of you feel like it's something you don't understand, that's a good example, just stop. Uh, so find a point in P closest to a query point Q and X. At this point, do you know what the nearest table problem is? Do you feel like you understand what it is? If I asked you, would you be able to retell that problem to me?
So BPQ is less than twice BPQ prime Q. Well, why, why, why do I want to say that? Why, why am I calling this an approximate <coughs> What do you think? The words, what might they be trying to convey here? Approximate neighbor to be like if you take it one epsilon, so it will be always within like twice the distance of it. Within twice the distance. So that's good. So it's not too bad. <laughs> it's within twice the distance. If you put epsilon zero, then you get the dpq is less than equal to dp prime q, and that is that means that this that this point uh, p is the closest point to q. So some of an epsilon is zero. This is the nearest neighbor that we already just, we just saw before. That was that kind of made sense. Now we put this epsilon in, and it kind of doesn't make sense, but it's kind of telling us we're not quite the nearest neighbor, but we're sort of kind of the nearest neighbor. So that, that's kind of, because a lot of the papers you're going to read are going to do things like this. They're going to talk about approximation problems, and so it's uh, this particular way of doing approximations is very familiar, is very common, and you should be used to seeing it. Okay, so we now define something called an approximate near-near problem where you want to get an answer that looks like it's kind of close. And where kind of close is controlled by this number epsilon. So they introduced a new problem. Okay, so they introduced an old problem, they did some lather, they introduced a new problem. We still haven't got the punch line yet. Okay, so we read further. We present, ah, okay, now what is this? We present two algorithmic results. What other kind is there? Uh, for the, I, I should say that the, the, the first author of this paper is my, was my grad school roommate for four years. And the second author was my advisor, so I can make fun of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we present two algorithmic results for the approximate version. Okay, fine, we just forget all that nearest neighbor stuff. We just worry about the approximate there. That significantly improved the node of marketing. <laughs> Pre-processing cost polynomial in n and d. What's d? The distance? Oh, now they mean d the dimension again. That d up there. Again, I'm not quite sure, but it probably that's what it means. <coughs> okay, I guess. And then truly sublinear, blah, 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 blah. Okay, stuff. They've got some bombs. Bombs are good. Further applying a classic geometry. No. Okay, I don't know. Or maybe I, maybe I do, but you go and solve it. <laughs> we obtain, okay, this seems to be important. We obtain the first known algorithm with polynomial processing and query time polynomial and d and log n. Okay, that seems like they think it's important. So if they think it's important, maybe they need to understand why they think it's important. That's the thing, right? In a paper, the author would claim things. You know, our paper is some sauce because of this. Because, you know, our cheese is flavored with other opinions of this and that. It's great. You don't have to believe them. It's a clue. What they're saying is a clue to why they think the paper is interesting. That's not always why the paper is interesting. Because people like to make claims. People think that their stuff is great. It's great. It's the best thing ever. But you have to apply some critical view to these things. But at least this gives you a clue as to what they think is important. Um, unfortunately, for small apps, okay, there's, so there's again noise, noise, noise. Experimental results, that sounds promising. We'll look at that later. <coughs> okay, so if you read the abstract of the paper, you get a very vague idea of what the paper is about. And that's all, that's okay. You don't need to get much more of that. In my opinion, abstract, I don't pay much more attention to what I just showed you. There's some problem. They define a problem. They define some approximate version. They want to solve the approximate version. They have some fast algorithms. There's something about polynomial and deal logic. At this point, that's all you need to know about here. You, don't, you shouldn't expect to know much more than that. And so when you were reading your abstracts for your proposal submissions, did you get how, how, how does it compare to what we just did here? Was it more or less along the same lines? Yes, no, maybe? Yes, do the yes, sir. <laughs> Were you okay with the fact that you kind of had a rough idea of what the paper was about? Yeah, yes. Getting the meaning of what they're claiming about. Okay, good. And that's all you need to know from the abstract. That's why often I wouldn't read the abstract, because it will repeat all again. Now they give context. I will say this, you know, without, uh, you know, without making it sound too uh, boastful. That theory papers in general do a reasonably good job of trying to outline the context of the paper. Okay. So the papers you're all picking up, people usually do a good job of trying to give you a history of where the result comes from, because there is some context. So that, this is a good clue. So now the introduction of three starts up. And we say, OK, nearest scenario problem is so-and-so, given a set of points. Again, this magic metric space with distance function d, again, something. 
Pre-process P, as so efficiently we know we saw it. And, and, and yes, yeah, so they've cut and paste the first two lines of the abstract. The low dimensional case is well solved. Ooh, there's a reference here. Someone has solved the low dimensional case, and the main issue is that dealing with cursive dimensionality. This seems something that could be interesting. So we go see, okay, reference 26. Come back here. And it was running out of the commentary geometry. So, so allegedly this book, <coughs> this is a book, solves the <coughs> low dimensional case. And it, at some point, maybe not at this particular moment, at some point you should probably make a note to yourself. So you make a note to yourself that says, We're going to do it just here. We didn't know. Okay, so now we go back. If this were a, a modern PDF, I could click on it, but unfortunately it's not. So, um, the cursor dimensionality, that sounds very dramatic, and it's in the title as well, so we should probably know what it is. So let's go back again. And yes, if you're getting seasick, just warn me. Of course, now my thing is correct. Yay, it will be scratched. Oh, another paper. So this paper somewhat talks about Of course you might be really curious and you might want to know what exactly this means. And might be you might feel like I need to really understand this motion before you go further. So you know. Well, there's a Wikipedia page for it. Great. Is awesome. Oh my God. So I'm reading maybe relatively quickly compared to what you might do, but I'm just skipping ahead to what this looks like. So that seems important. I'm not sure why, but it seems to be an issue. Uh, dimensionality is a blanket term. It is also a style. I don't understand. Oh, nearest neighbor search. Let's look at this. Okay, so, so at this point, how much do you think you want to know the person in the channel? Again, I was very, very quickly through this, but it seems like. At least what I got so far is high dimension equals bad for some reason. So again, you might you, now you might choose it. You might feel like you need to go more, and you should go with that paper if they cited, right? Or you might feel like okay, this is enough for now. I need to go on, and that's again up to you. There's some choices here, right? Okay, so let's go back. So we're still we're still reading the intro, right? Because <coughs> the mentality was the sixties. Uh, despite blah blah blah. Okay. This is an important line right here because this line is saying something about what's wrong with the prior work. And that's context right there. If you need to know why this paper got written, why this paper is interesting, you need to know what is the thing that they're improving or what was known before. And somewhere in the paper they'll get mention of this. Like here, in fact, for the large G in theory or in practice, they provide a little improvement of our brute force algorithm. Which compares Q to each P and P. So now I'm thinking, okay, brute force. What are, what are a brute force algorithm for nearest neighbor look like? Put the paper over, think about it. If you had to do brute force and you want to find a nearest neighbor for a query, what would you do? You just look at everything. How long will that take? If you have end points, how long will it take? It'll take N. It'll actually take a little bit longer. Because each point, if you think of it, these things as living in a d-dimensional space, they have D coordinates. So to compare a query against a point and measure distance will take how long? It'll take d time. So now you think, okay, brute force, d time per point, n points, it takes n times d. Okay, so what they're saying is that n times d is a bad thing. We want to do better than n times d. We don't know what that product might do, but they want to do better than n times d. Okay, that's a, that's a benchmark they've set up for this paper. 
Okay. Okay. The known cost algorithm are two kinds: low pre-processing cost. Do you know what pre-processing is? Sort of. Could you guess what it might be? Wait, sorry, I can't see you. <coughs> okay. No, yeah. Okay, is it like uh, removing the noise or like the normalizing? It might be. We don't know yet. We don't know what it means, but it's it's, some, it's something. It, but it's something you do ahead of time. It's pre-processing. That's what you're kind of implying. That's all we can say. It might be that. It might be something else. But so it says low pre-processing cost, but query time linear and NNP. So we know how to get query time linear and NNP. We just do brute force. And they're saying that's a bad one. That's a known algorithm of all that time. That seems not very interesting. Or query time sublinear and N and polynomial and D with severely exponential pre-processing cost N to the D. Okay, let's try to parse the sentence because this seems like it might be important. I mean, it's important because they're saying we're going to improve the running times. So we need to understand what these running times are. So they're saying something has exponential pre-processing cost N to the D. Why is it exponential? What is exponential about this? N to the D. That seems like a nice and to the something. Why would you call it exponential? Why, why would they call this exponential? That doesn't make any sense. It's n to the something. n to the something is always polynomial. The problem is high d, large d, they increase it very fast. Yeah, so they were talking about high d and d. So if, they, if they're worried about high d, then they're worried about d being the parameter that they don't want to be exponential in. So then n to the d, it's not n to the something, it's something to the d is what they're saying. So you should think of this as something to the d and that's a bad thing. For them. They somehow are saying that this is bad because d is very large. And if you think about what, you, what is your input size for um, a nearest neighbor problem, if I give you a bunch of points, what is the total size of the input? There are n points. Each has d coordinates. So the input size is n times d, not n. So if you do things that are exponential in d, that is exponential in the input size. It's kind of a bad thing. You like to fix that. So that's kind of what they're at. So this is a bad thing. And the same thing is, unfortunate situation carries over to average case. I don't know what that means. Even to the approximate problem, you simply find again here. And now again, they repeat this. <coughs> now you can try to understand okay, this is what they're talking about. We present two algorithms that significantly improve the known bounds, a pre processing cost that's polynomial in NMD. So I guess that must compare to the exponential in NMD here. So, so they have the exponential in NMD here. And now they're saying it's all oh, no, it's going to be polynomial in NMD. <coughs> And the query time is linear. And there's some other stuff here that I understand. And they, and they, they keep saying this over and over again. The first known algorithm with polynomial processing and query time polynomial in D and log A. So we knew that our brute force algorithm took time D times N. They seem to think they can get that N down to log A. And while they be keeping the, the, the query, the dependence on D polynomial. If you are to solve a search problem, if you do binary search, how long does it take to do binary search? Log n. So uh, if, you, if you think of near neighbor search as, oh, this is a search problem, binary search is a search problem, that problem can be solved in log n time. You, you would like any search problem to be solved in log n time, including this one. And our current algorithm was n times d, which is kind of clearly very dumb. So they somehow want to do something better. They want to get log n. Okay? And again, they repeat some stuff. And OK, so now here's something interesting. Its key ingredient is a notion of locality sensitive hashing that may be of independent interest. So now they've added another twist. OK, we give these two outcomes, we speed up the running times, and now we introduce this idea called blah, 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 blah. So now you know something more about it. You also know something more about the context. You know about the history. And if you read up, now, now at this point, you could even say, OK, suppose I could do nearest neighbor search in one dimension. How would I do? And this is a good time to put away the paper and just think. I want you to near this neighbor search in one dimension. What does that mean? I have a bunch of points on the line, and a query comes in, and I want to find the closest point. How might I do it? Think of it as a brand new problem. You can sort it, and then what do you do? And then it's binary search. Right? OK, so you can sort it and do binary search. How much pre processing time does it take? Endpoints, fix and log in. And how much does the query time take? So I can do queries in log in time with pre processing and log in. In their book, that would be great. Okay. Suppose I'm in two dimensions. Now what do I do? Now it might get a bit harder, I'm thinking. I can't do binary search.
research anymore. Some of you may have taken some geometry classes, you might know the trick for doing this, but some of you may not. In that case, you say, okay, there's a book that claims to be able to solve this problem. Maybe I should go look at that. If I, yeah, again, if you want to, you can go look at that and try to understand how you can do this in lower dimensions. At this point, I'm trying to understand, they seem to make this big thing about lower dimensions, high dimensions, and I don't know why. And so one way is to say, let me first figure out why it's so easy in low dimensions. I can do one dimension, maybe I can do two, and maybe I can do fixed number of dimensions or something like that. You, can go, maybe should, you could go look at that. You could go look at it right now, but you probably won't. So, but that's something you could do. So maybe we should put a note to ourselves saying, you know, um, understand, you know, understand the 2D case. Okay. So just putting notes about So we can, we can put an answer here. <coughs> so that's all I know about spirit. Okay. So I'm, but I'm building up knowledge like that. Okay. Motivation. Now again, this your taste may vary in this. You know. Uh, these are usually a required section, you know, why, why do we care about this problem? And you can say there's a variety of applications, including similarity searching, there's a whole bunch of references. Do not try to track on all these references, it will be a very bad idea. If, you, if you're interested and you see, oh, there's something in the image in video databases, I know something on images, let me go look it up, go look it up and see. But otherwise, I don't, you know, you have to make it some judgments about what you really can. And then you read, okay, typically the features of the object of interest, and now they're trying to explain how it works, are represented as points in RD and a distance metric is used and the basic problem is to produce indexing or similarity searching. So the thing is you have a bunch of images and you have a query image, you want to find something that is nearby, you represent each image as some kind of point and you want to find the nearest point. That, okay, that kind of makes sense. Yes, does it, does it make sense to you when I say that? Yeah, maybe that's good enough for now. Oh, and then there's a the number of features, the dimensionality, you think, okay, why would that be? Well. I have a feature for every, I have one feature, and I have another feature, another feature, and you get this long description of the object. And so I guess that's the dimension of the, of the object. And that could be very large. And there's a bunch of different things. Of late, okay, approximate. This is again motivation. Um, and so now you read this. So the claim here is that somehow we can avoid this penalty of paying things that are high, of, of, being, of being very bad at high dimensions by using approximations. This is the claim again. This is the claim that we'll have to evaluate as we go along and, and see whether they get able to do this. Okay. And, so, and so they're trying to argue now, okay, this seems like overkill, this is and that, so okay, why should we consider approximate near neighbor? So this whole thing is, we should consider approximate nearest neighbor, and here's why, you know, here's why we should do it. And, but wait, so far this hasn't quite worked. And this recent result of Kleinberg seems important. And again, we could go say, put a note to ourselves. <coughs> so we've already noted a whole bunch of things we don't have to read, just after reading this, a couple of pages of this paper. And that's again normal. That's why I, keep, I was saying that you should start early because to write this project, to do this project, it's not going to be even close to being enough to read the one paper you've been assigned. You have to do a lot of stuff around it because of this context. And again, the judgment of what to read and what not to read is something you will learn. You will have to quickly be able to sort of sap the paper and say, this is what's wrong, right? Okay, previous work. Again, there's a lot of very detailed previous work here. There's, there's this, there's this. Again, you can choose to see what you want to look at. Um, the survey of edge, data structures for nearest neighbors, some perform well in two or three dimensions, some are worse. Uh, okay, so Dobkin and Lipton were the first to provide an algorithm for nearest neighbors in RD. So this is not a trivial problem. If you were in a more it might, might have been hard. And look at the query time. The query time was log n, which is kind of what we wanted, but two to the d. So somehow as the dimension was increasing, they were spending much more time depending on the dimension, but the log n terms stayed the same. And the pre-processing cost was pretty big, n to the 2 to the d. That seems like a lot, compared to the log n that we did for, for uh, sort. 
And then someone else improved this, they reduced this to n to the d over 2, which is actually a lot better than the previous one, because that was n to the 2 to the d, is n to the d over 2. But then the penalty was the query dimension wall. It became 2 to the d log d. Okay. Now these things are important. I mean, uh, at the beginning you start reading these results, these numbers kind of blaze over. But they're kind of important, right? You basically think of it that you brought down the dependence on the dimension to exponential in the exponent, to just linear in the exponent, which is good. But it's still exponential. Whereas the query time has gone from 2 to the d log n to 2 to the d log d log. <coughs> 2 to the d log d is something like d factorial, roughly. <coughs> but if you didn't know that, that's fine. Still, you could clearly tell that the query time has gone up. So query time has gone up, preprocessing time has gone up. That seems like you know, a fair trade off. And there's been some other results. Blah, 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 blah. All suffer query time exponential and d. In fact, that's correct. And then this person obtained a query time d to the 5 log n. That seems a lot better. We've gone from exponential in D to polynomial in D. So maybe this problem is solved now. Why do we have this paper? Oh, but wait. The pre-processing is now exponential in D. <coughs> so again, you don't, you don't need to fixate on that why is it equal to the 5. It doesn't matter. At least for this first reading. Maybe at some point it will, but it won't matter yet. But this is telling us a story now. right? This, all of this, this cryptic form is telling us a story. There was a lot of work in the lower dimensional case. The low dimensional case people knew what to solve. It, they, we call it low dimensional because that means they weren't worried about, well, they, clearly they weren't worried about the dependency on the dimension. And so they had all these bounds, and you would get to the best part you could get is something that looked like this. But you're still stuck with this thing for the exponential dimension, and that's where this paper appears to be coming. So now we're getting a bit of richer sense of the context. Why this paper came to be? Why do we even care about it? Okay. You won't just get that from reading their abstract. You kind of have to read through carefully what they're referring to. And that tells you the story. The story is very important. And there will always be a story. Okay? Okay. It's been a while. We've been reading this for about 40 minutes. We haven't really got very far into it. Again, that's normal. You're not going to understand the paper in one reading or two or three or four or five. It's going to be many, many more. So give yourself time, give yourself some time, block of time just to sort of concentrate it. Maybe read a paragraph at a time and keep practice time, that's okay. Any questions? So far. So first of all, do you feel this paper is a, is a fair paper to compare against the other ones you've done for your project? Do you feel like this is equally complicated and equally cryptic when you were having, since you've had the experience of reading other papers for your selections? I think it's kind of on the right, you know, or is it too easy or something? <coughs> so another question I have is when you were reading this paper, and you probably did read your paper more than just the abstract, to what extent were you doing what I'm doing right now? Were you doing the same thing? Or were you doing something completely different? <coughs> is there something I've said so far that is like, oh, I didn't know I should do it that way? This is from my own interest, I just want to know. Yes? How oh, I? I guess I, I probably would have figured it out, but I did not. I was supposed to check all of those references and do a lot of external reading too. Okay, and this is something to go to. Well, again, not all, but as you see the need, you yeah. should, you will have to go and look at all these things. Yes, exactly. Yes? I think I normally go to the recursive loop, which I explained before. So I try to put, okay, if I'm going, if I take one term, I wouldn't go more than two terms deep. It means that I just ignore the other. Okay, so you just skip it. I just keep it if I'm going, if I don't know something and then if I don't know what's in that, normally it is, but I like your idea. Skip early so that you save more time to charge. Actually, the explanation could be coming later in the paper. It might. It might. And, and sometimes you may not need to know. Not I mean, uh, I have read papers that, you know, a couple of years later I came back to that same paper and read it again and realized there were many things there that I didn't know. That I didn't need the first time I read it. And so, when you read a paper, there's always a need. Like, like in your case, you're writing a report. Which means you've got to understand how this parts work. You don't need to understand every single detail. There's going to be lots of parts of paper that are not relevant. There might be one particular thing that you like very much you want to spend most of your time talking about. And that's okay. So that's why it's good to sort of initially do kind of a beat. But again, everyone has their own taste. I don't want to say that you should do it one way or the other. But it's easy to get overwhelmed if you have to track down every one. A DFS is a very bad idea, at least in the beginning of paper. Any other thoughts, comments, reactions so far to what I've been saying? Is it useful? Is it, you know? You all know this, or so for note taking? Yeah. So note taking seems really difficult when you're when you're trying to read the paper, right? Oh, no, on a on a screen, I think. 
Yeah. yeah. Yes, and because by the time I finish one or two paragraphs, I have enough terms which are already like, okay, I don't want to do this. Yeah. I have too many Yes. So what do you do? I have no idea. It's tough, and I, I, I always recommend, at least on your reading paper, to print it out. I know it's old school, but print it out, or if you have some very good annotation mechanism on your iPad or whatever, that's fine. But but have some way to write things down. I find that for myself, I'm reading, I'm writing things down, trying out conjectures, trying out a little algorithm, it helps a lot to make sense. I can almost rewrite what they're saying in my own language, so it can make sense to me. Because they're writing in the language they understand. Okay, so we're at the point now where we've, you know, Okay, well, let, let's actually, let me, let me just see the landscape. Okay, so they have, they've, now they've done a review of exact nearest neighbor problems, and we know this bound, and we seem to, that we seem to, if you mark it, marking off, this seems like the best we have so far, right? And now, now they're going to approximate near neighbor, because that's another thing they need to review. And they, and they said, Arya Mom gave an algorithm with query time, oh, still exponential in D, that's no good, still exponential in D, that's no good. Still exponential in D, still no good. Feinberg gave one, oh, this much, query time polynomial in D, but preprocessing time exponential in D. So, getting better. Although preprocessing polynomial in D, but query time is, is n plus one. <coughs> so this is, this is still slightly better. It's still bad, it's linear to n, but it's slightly better than n times D. So this paper seems to be the most relevant paper prior to this one. In the sense that it does some of what this paper wants to do. It gets things that are kind of polynomial, but are this limited. So you, definitely this should be marked up as a paper you should read much, much more carefully. Not all the other ones, but this one, this Feinberg paper. So you put that. There's a bunch of other stuff. They gave retrieving all points. Okay, that's a different problem. That's fine. We want points chosen random, that's a different problem. We won't worry about that. And then very recently, this paper received obtained a similar proposition three below. So this paper is also seems to be four. They got a similar result. And now they get their result. And now we're in the main chunk of the paper. There's an algorithm for epsilon near neighbor search. I don't know what this means. Well, ignore that. Which uses this much pre-processing and this much query time. So now you can say, does this capture what they've been telling us all along? Well, the pre-processing time, is it exponential in D? No. It's good. Query time, is it exponential in D? No. Does it have dependency on log n? No. So it's, it doesn't seem to be quite what they promised, but it's got something that's exponential. So they got terms that are not exponential in D in both the pre-processing and the query time. That seems like a good thing. So that's the main result. So proposition 1 seems very important. What's proposition 2? There's an algorithm under any LP norm, and uses this much preprocessing that's exponential D, but requires only query time. I don't know if I like this, but it's got a lot of preprocessing time. And now another one, there's an algorithm for this in RD, which uses N D to the O of 1. What does that mean? O of 1 is shorthand for some constant. So it's polynomial and N D preprocessing, that's good. And requires D query time, that seems really good. Much better than the previous one. So wait, why do I have proposition one and proposition three? Yeah. Uh, so so zero. Zero. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Anyone put hand? Yes. So in different values for epsilon. Yes. So good point. Three epsilon is less than zero. Uh, greater than zero. Yeah. Or greater than zero. Yeah. So that means any epsilon will work. Whereas here you need to be epsilon more than once. That's one difference. What else? What other differences? Well, one has n d to the constant preprocessing time. This is n to the one plus one over epsilon. I'm not sure how that compares because that one over epsilon could be a constant here. But the query time here is d times n to the one over epsilon. Here it's only d. So the query time here is better. So probably the preprocessing is worse. Otherwise, why would you? Otherwise, this result would strictly be better than that. So this preprocessing is worse, but the query time is better. This preprocessing is better, but the query time is worse. And you'll often find this in a paper that also produce as many results as they can sort of generate from their ideas and allow these different trade-offs. So it'll be good to have some landscape. Yes? These are the results. Why are they calling it propositions? That's a good question. Why are they calling it propositions? It's somewhat arbitrary. Uh, there is there's no rhyme or reason. You think that you call it a theorem. But, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Because it's both in a proof that maybe that's why the paper is about. This is what we say we did, and now we're going to prove that that's what we did. It's possible, that's how they want to do it. Yeah. 
and, and you'll, you'll often be like, no, this is a lemma, but that's a theorem, why? There's no real reason. It's just a sense of, okay, this is too small to be a theorem, we'll call it that one. This is, I, I have no idea what people call me a proposition, I don't know. Okay, so now at this point, we know what the paper is supposedly about, we know what the main results kind of are, and we have some context for why the authors think they're important. That's not so bad for this much time. It's pretty decent. Of course, we know nothing about the paper itself. But that's fine. And at this point, if you want us to say, okay, I'm done for the day, that's a good point to stop. <laughs> I'm not letting you go here, but I'm saying if this paper you're done for the day, it's, it's, that's a lot to take in already. That you have some sense of the paper, and that's good. You've done one initial short pass, you've read through a couple of pages, and you've got some idea of the paper. And maybe you could kind of explain this is actually a good time with your project partner for each of you to try, okay, I'm going to try and explain to you what this paper is about. And you pretend you have no idea what's going on. And you will find if you have to actually sit on a board and explain something to someone, you will realize where your lapses in understanding are. And if you find, oh, I need to go look at the paper again, you don't really understand this work. And so you should go back to me again. So that's why I've encouraged people to work in pairs. And even if, you, if you're working alone, you can find a friend, a friend who's going to suffer through all this kind of stuff. And uh, say, you know, uh, just, just listen, I want to explain this to you. And you should be able to explain to them without looking at the paper at this point. A, what the problem is about, what the result is kind of what, maybe to look at the paper to get the actual numbers, but apart from that, you know what it is, and why it's interesting. If you can't, then you should try maybe go with doing it. Okay? All right. Any questions? I, I love feedback, by the way, on whether this is so far has been useful to you or not. We've done, I've done projects for many years in this class, and usually people do a lot of trouble trying to understand how to write the project report and to do it. And I think it ultimately does boil up to how to read these papers, and that's why I'm doing this now. But if, if there are things you prefer I be talking about, or please tell me now or tell me later, feedback, whatever I'd like to hear about. <coughs> okay, so now that we have some sense, you come back, you've gone away for a day or two, you let it sort of cook in your head for a bit, you come back to it now. And this cooking in your head is actually a real thing. It actually works very well. Things start going around and rattling around. Like, oh, okay, that means all I want. Like, you know, it's good. It's a good. It's a good feeling. To have voices talking. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if they're math voices. So now we'd like to understand. Okay, that's all well and good, but how? How do they? And that's where you have to be. That's where it gets really tricky to read a paper because the paper will tell you in gory detail how they do it, but that's not really useful. Right. For example, if I said, okay, I want you to solve records of the Moss theorem, and here is the mechanical process, and here is how you do it, and here is the proof of why the Moss theorem is correct, you will know how to do it, but you won't know. You'll just be able to follow instructions. And a paper is often like that. It's a series of instructions to get you from the claim to the proof. Right? And that's fine. It will get you from the claim to the proof, and you can verify every step, but it won't give you any understanding. It rarely does. Unless the paper is really one. The hard part of reading a paper, especially a math paper like a theory paper like this, is that you have to go into the argument and figure out what's really good. And that takes work. So when I told you, for example, in the master theorem, look at those two terms, right? The AFN over B and F of N. They represent the merge part and the, and, the, and, the, and the divide part, and they're kind of fighting with each other. And whichever one wins dominates the cost. That's a higher level of understanding of what's going on. That is not in the proof. No proof of the master will ever say this. But it's implicit inside there when you look at the analysis. So you have to start, you have to somehow find a way to get beyond the writing and figure out what's really good. Okay. And that's where that's where it that's the hard part of the project. Trying to understand what's really good. And I should say that for especially for papers that are kind of older like this one, you will find on the web copious lecture notes. Many, many different lecture notes that will explain what's going on. So in some sense, you could, I won't say cheat, but you could easily figure out what's going on in the paper and write something. But I would strongly encourage you not to do that, because everyone approaches a paper in their own way. When I read a paper, and I understand it in some way, and I go and explain to my friend, like, what are you talking about? This is, this, this is not the paper. That, the paper is thought like this. And they will be fighting back and forth for a while. This is very common. Everyone approaches a paper and understands something from it in their own way. If you read someone else's notes, yes, you will again be able to follow what they said, probably. But it's not the same thing as following it when you read yourself. 
That's where the learning will come. So again, you could write a report just by using the lecture notes, but frankly, I'll give it down. <laughs> if there's no, if there's words but no understanding. Because I've used to read some of the So try. You will gain a lot more if you fight with the material yourself. And then if you want, you can go read some lecture notes, but don't do it first. Don't, don't corrupt your mind with other people's viewpoints yet. Come up with your own first, and then you can start. Okay. They finally explain now how they get results. We obtain <coughs> results by reducing ENNS to a new problem, point location equal ball. This is achieved by a novel data structure called ring code data. Okay, this is something that's going to be important. This R technique can be viewed as a variant of blah, 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 blah. I don't know if I've researched this, this does not perform. Um, well, yeah. So again, if you do pattern research, this whole paragraph will be useful. If you don't, could care less. Why do they write it? Well, because there are lots of people in the audience who know pattern research. They want to put the context for them. It's not for you. Um, in section four, we give two solutions. Okay, good. So section three, so now we have a map. Section three contains the idea. Section four gives solutions. One is based on something. Um, and, the, and for the second, we use something else. Okay, so now we can start writing. So we can start saying something like, okay, so outline. So section three has ring cover trees. Section four has two algorithms. Algorithm one seems to use, again, I'm just copying words. I have no idea what this means. So now you have a bit of a roadmap of the paper as well. Right? You can go jump into a section and jump out as you need to because now you know there's something there going on. And, and again, now, now this is where your, your taste may vary from mine. For me, if I'm reading this paper right now, I'm going to go straight into that section and look at what's going on. But that's because I have a certain amount of context and I know I can just jump in and jump out. You might not want to do that. You might want to keep reading. So what do you want to do? Shall we, do you want to jump into section three and four or do you want to keep reading? Jump, where do we jump? Section three or section four? Three. Section three? Okay, let's just ignore the stuff. Okay. Ooh, there's stuff here. Blah, 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 blah. <coughs> it's a good idea usually if there's a preliminary section to read it because it introduces notation. And sometimes you, you need the notation. So let, let, let me quickly look at the, the preliminary section. So we use LDP term space RD under, okay, this norm keeps coming up. We're gonna have to figure out what this means. So, It might be good to sort of draw some examples that the Manhattan distance, the Salt Lake, well, Salt Lake City distance, in fact, is kind of an L1 distance because you're basically walking along a grid for the most part. Okay, let's go back. Not here. Okay, so we know an LP norm is for any point V, we denote by V the LP norm, we know what that means. We omit the subscript and VP equal to 2, that's just convenience because it's not real, right? So fine. HD is equal to 0, 1 to the D, DH will denote the Hamming metric space of dimension D. I have no idea what the Hamming metric is. Mm. Or at least, if I were you, I probably would not know what the Hamming metric is. How many of you know what the Hamming metric is? Right, so very few, good. So, okay, now we're gonna go back again. And this is where it gets kind of annoying. And, it, and uh, I've had many students complain to me in the reading of the paper for the first time, it's just like, every word doesn't make sense. <laughs> yes, that happens sometimes. <laughs> I'm sure you felt that. 
Okay, having distance. And if the having distance between two strings of equal length is the number of positions at which the, the corresponding symbols are different. Okay, all right. Okay, that kind of makes sense. So you have a bunch of strings and you look at whether they're different, you add up all the differences. And in our case, if we go back quickly, these were zero, one <coughs> strings. So hopefully you know that zero, one to the D means D bit strings, right? So that means I just look at all the distances that are different. Okay, I don't know why we care about this, but fine. Let M x equal x d be any metric space. We might need to know what a metric space is at this point. Can't really avoid it. So one more order to go look at. So let's go look at metric space. It helps to have two monitors. And, and uh, I, I know, lest you think that I don't actually do this, I, I, I do all of these things all the time. You'd be surprised how many obscure notions Wikipedia has nice pages on so you can read stuff. Or they have bad pages and you feel like, I should edit this, and you get distracted. <laughs> so a metric space, what's the definition? A metric space is an ordered pair, M is a set, D e is a function. Okay, that looks like it takes two things and produces a number. So set has its properties. Okay, and again, with the benefit of hindsight, I can tell you the real thing that matters is this one, this triangle inequality. But you don't know that, so I promise you. It'd make a big deal. That's a side issue that, that, that's important. Okay. Because these things are, okay, it's not negative, it's symmetric, that seems fine, but this seems to be non trivial. And if you draw a picture, it'll tell you, okay, as x, y, and z, the distance from x to y to y to z is more than the shortcut distance. And so I like to think of metric space as shortcuts are good. And it's good to have the little words in your head. Okay, so I kind of, I have a definition of metric space. I may not fully understand it, but I, I have a definition of it. So, sorry, go back to the paper. We imply the one BPP is the min QP, so this is the distance from P to the set is the closest point of the set. Max P, DPQ is the diameter of the set. Okay, that seems reasonable now. So now we're still in section two, we need some notation. Oh boy, it's so getting complicated here. The ball of radius R similar to P is defined as BPR as this. Okay, that's just a definition. The ring centered at P is defined as ring is to BP R2 minus BPR1. Again, it's helpful to draw this. Basically, you're saying, okay, this you take a ball of radius R2 and you subtract the ball of radius R1. So if there was any chalk here, I can draw this. I can't draw this anymore. So basically, think of yeah, it's a big circle here, and your little circle inside, you take that middle, the angle is free. That's a ring. That is a ring. So it's a good name for me. <laughs> Let V D be the volume of a ball. The following fact is standard. The good is standard, so I can ignore it because I have no idea what this stuff is. So I'm going to move on. And maybe some of you have seen this. That's fine. And now we're finally in section three. Okay? The key idea is to reduce the epsilon and an S to the following problem. Okay, so you want to take the original problem and use this problem, presumably that you'll solve this one and you can solve that again. That's the idea. And what's this problem? Point location and equal balls. Given n radius r balls, centered at these different centers, to devise a data structure for any point, and q does the following. If there exists some ci, which is a center, such that q belongs to b c i r, we go up here, we remind ourselves, oh, this is the ball of radius r centered at p. So this is the ball of radius r centered at c i. So if there exists a CI that Q is inside the ball of radius R centered CI, then return CI, else return no. So this problem is saying, or it seems to be saying, I have a bunch of balls of radius R, I have a query point. If the query point sits inside a ball, return that center, otherwise give up. And this might be a good time to stop and think, what does this have to do with nearest neighbor? Why would this be a problem that might come up in your So when you're doing a nearest neighbor query, let's say your nearest neighbor is some point. And let's say the distance to that point is <coughs> r. So now what can you say? If you drew balls of radius r around every point in your input, and my query came in, where would it hit? It would be inside the ball for that point that's your nearest neighbor. So again, <coughs> something you need to draw this, right? So you see. I have my nearest neighbor, it's somewhere nearby, and the distance between us is r. So let me draw a ball of radius r, that's basically to be doing, around that point. I am going to be inside that ball, because that's my nearest neighbor. So they seem somewhat related. 
I'm not sure how, but there's some kind of connection. Again, when you're reading a paper like this, you're going to have to talk about a lot of fuzziness until you start making sense. It's not going to make sense yet, but there's some kind of connection. Okay. So now we have a new problem, which I've defined for some reason, epsilon point location. And so point location, so there's going to be some approximations on right now between one epsilon. And in fact, there is. If there exists a CI who is this thing return yes, and a point, oh, OK. So this thing, if there is a good answer to your question that queries inside the ball of radius r, then return yes, but don't return ci. Return some other ci. That's kind of the right answer. So it's giving you an easier goal. And if q is not in any of the balls, then just say no, it's not any of them. And if the point is somewhat between this range, if the point ci close to q, you have r is between these two values, then you don't know. So there's even three cases here. Either you're in the ball, which is return something close by, or you're significantly outside every ball, which is the second case, then return I don't know. And there's some region of maybe in the middle where you don't know. So this is a kind of relaxed version of the problem. So it's not a yes or no, it's like yes for sure, no for sure, and man. That's what I Again, we have no idea what So now the claim is this. Observe that the pleb can be reduced to NNS with the same pre-processing query cost as follows. So the thing that the pleb can be reduced to NNS, you want to work the other way around, but the thing, okay, but how? And this is again a good point where to stop and say, how do you do this? This thing that pleb can be reduced to near neighbor search. So it means if you have an algorithm that can solve the near neighbor search problem, you can solve the pleb problem. And let's remind ourselves again what the pleb problem is. How do you do that? So they claim you can, they're going to give you the answer in like five seconds there. But stop, don't, don't look at the answer. How would I take, what, with what I've read so far, all I know so far, I have a nearest neighbor search, I'll think that solve the nearest neighbor, it gives me the nearest neighbor to my, to my query, and solve this pleb problem that takes an R as well. <coughs> so clearly I have points in the pleb problem, the CIs, that are probably going to be my points from my nearest neighbor. Okay. And this radius r, and I want to be able to say, is there, is there something inside that uh, radius r or not? So what do you think I should do? And again, we don't, we've only just discovered this problem for the first time today. So we don't really know much more. But we can think, what might we try? How would I reduce this problem to the nearest neighbor? Could you somehow do, like, binary search on the radius? Good. So some kind of binary search, maybe. So tell me how. So remember, I have an oracle that will solve your neighbor for any. So I, given a bunch of points to give the query, I can get the nearest neighbor. So that's my that's my black box. I can use the black box as much as I want. That's a good idea. So, binary, so let's try it. Like, what, so what might I try to do? <coughs> yeah. In some sense, I have a I have a point. I'm trying to find the center, the bar which has where my point is. Right. About the radius r. The radius r. Yeah, the is where. Right. And I have to find a way to compare the ball in such that I can say, oh, it's not in green balls, faster than. <laughs> well, no, I, no, I don't want to do faster. I just want to solve it using my nearest neighbor black box. That's all I want. So maybe you've thought for five minutes. You're not really seeing what to do. You're like, I, I don't know. And you go look. It's, it's OK. But we should think about it a little bit. It suffices to find an exact nearest neighbor and compare its distance from Q with R. So what they're saying is call the nearest neighbor algorithm, get the answer for the distance and the point, and measure this distance. What, suppose it's more than R. That means the nearest neighbor to Q is more than R away. So it can't be in any of the points because it's more than R away. So the answer for that problem is no. Suppose the distance is less than r, then we have the point whose distance is less than r2, it must be in that ball. And so we can answer yes. And that's the answer. So it's good to do these things, again, even if you look at the answer. So look at the answer they give you, because it just helps you kind of warm up your brain to thinking the way they're thinking of the problem. And that's going to be important as well. And so the main point of the section is to show that there is a reduction in the other direction. And it's not just goes one way, which is the easy way, but it goes the other way, which is useful, because we want to solve the near neighbor problem, not the pleb problem. And presumably the pleb problem will be somewhat easier to solve as we will be doing this. <coughs> so 
it's been pretty intense. <laughs> I don't know about you, but this is quite a lot. I mean, these tables are quite dense, and we're only on after skipping a bunch of stuff around page three. This is a ten-page paper, and we, I, I don't think any of us can say that we really fully understand what's going on here. We're kind of just skating along, hanging along, for doing like. And that again, part of the thing, the reason I want to do this lecture is to explain to you that this feeling is very normal when you're reading paper for the first, second, third, or fourth time. There's always this feeling of, I only really have a sense of what's happening. It's over repeated readings, focusing on specific things, that you will start assembling a larger picture. And this is the biggest difference between reading a research paper. And for those of you who have read research papers, you know, maybe this is all over that to you. But the biggest difference between reading a research paper and reading you know, anything other than writing. A magazine article, something else that you don't read linearly. We're doing it now, but we're jumping around all over the place. And as we get further into the paper, we'll probably jump around everywhere. Go back and forth, try to play this. It's not a linear thing, it's not a one thing. You have to go over and over. And that brings me back to my earlier point. Give yourself time. You need to read it, put it away, spend a day doing something else, come back to it, do it again. Talk to your partner. Argue over stuff. Try to, try to explain things to each other. Figure out what's not working. What way you want something is lacking. And that's where you'll start getting a sense of what's going on. And that's just to understand what they're doing. How to get a deeper insight is one thing. You'll start playing with examples, <coughs> and you'll say, oh, I see what's happening. And some of the other algebra will start making sense. But for that, you have to really engage with them. Questions? The most subdued I've seen in all my Yes. How often do you read papers to this extent? I mean, to this extent? Yeah. I mean, do you typically time. find yourself skimming them more, or do you, is every paper you pick up read to this degree? So, actually, it is read to this degree. It's just that since I'm saying it out loud, it seems like a lot more. But in my head, I'm doing exactly what I'm showing you. You have to read it at a fine level. Otherwise, you won't get other. There is a. A paper, if you look at the information content in a paper over the 10 pages, the beginning part is fairly low. There's all introductory marketing matter. Then at some point on page 5, you have a whole paper right there, in a nutshell, in one line somewhere. That is a huge information content. So you really get to that point. And then, so you have to be able to read it. In other words, at a very fine level of detail to pick up that. And you, but you also have to know when not. That's, that's the skill in reading a paper that people learn is <coughs> when to sort of let things go and when to say, no, no, this seems to be important. I don't know why. I need to pursue it further. And many times I'm wrong. I will go off on these wild goose chases for days on end, tracking down some statement. And I realize, oh, that's why I misread the definition. That's why I was like that. So that, I make mistakes all the time. But you will make these guesses about how to finally read sentences, words, you know, pairs, a couple of words here and there. And you will go to that. And I do that when I'm reading. Over time, I've become you know, faster at this. And I have a better gut instinct for when I can ignore and when I can't ignore. I have some background knowledge, so I know what to skip. But if it's a new area, I do the same. It takes a while. So you need concentration, you need quiet time, you need it. There was a question back. Right. So when you look at the context of these other resources and references, how deep do you go? Because if you do the same process over again for another paper, then it's really daunting. Or it does. if you do a book, then that would, I'm not going to read a whole book. You're not going to read a whole book, but you're going to find, yeah. So I mean, I know, George, I mean, you, you are probably close to the experience of, you know, at least maybe two, two three years away from it, of having to assimilate a mountain of material very quickly, where you don't know anything about anything. Do you have any yeah. suggestions for them, about, especially this question about how much to dig into prior resources and how to decide when to, you know, when you're reading some new material? You're not going to know until you get practice doing it. Um, I mean, I, uh, I had to dive into piles and piles of papers before I figured out how to read, uh, read stuff to, to find the, what I was looking for. Um, books and all that, you're only going to read chapters, right? I mean, a um, section of a chapter, a of a chapter is all, all you care about. I mean, uh, what, when you're looking for uh, information at this level in a book, uh, uh, the only part you're going to care about is uh, chapter by chapter. So well, maybe one page, maybe would explain something. Right. And this referencing was not done the best way. Ideally, for a book, you would reference the chapter number, page number, section number for, for a particular reference. You don't just reference a book. Not, not, not in the way they're using the reference. They're not referencing that for 
this is all about compilation. They're referencing a particular kind of low dimensional algorithm. So they should have given a much more direct information. So unfortunately, you have to go find that. But I think that point is good. You, you, you're not, when you're reading a, a prior resource, you're not reading the whole thing. You have to go jump into it to find what you mean and then come back out. And you have to make some judgments and you will be wrong. And that's why we are there to help. Right? That's one way in which we can help you without giving you answers, is to help you know when to jump back out. It took the room of you. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, when I read the problem I have is I fool myself thinking that I understood it. Yes. And then only very late I know that oh, all elements are completely wrong. I made my full full tough theories. And this happens to me all the time. Even now. I, I, I read this paper like, yes, this makes perfect sense. And I go and explain to someone. Like, this is how it works. And then I'm stuck. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, yeah, I actually wrote some more paper. Let me go back and let me come back to next week. Next week. So this happens to me even now. But it's, that doesn't mean you should do it. We build up a, a model in our head of what the paper is saying. That's actually very valuable. You should do that. If at some point the paper tells you you're wrong, yes, you have to scrap the model and start again. But if you don't build up that model, then you will be say, assaulted by a stream of facts coming at you. And you will have no way to do them. The only way we retain lots of information in our head, the way people seem to remember every single paper, is not because they have a memory for papers, because they have a, a formal structure of their brain to put things in. A little cover, a little shelf to put their little information facts in. When you're reading a paper, you're building a model of what the paper is about, and you're slotting the facts into those into the different shelves. If you don't have that, you will not be able to, the paper will make no sense. It will be just a stream of things, one after the other. So do do that. If it's wrong, tear it down, start again. But it will never be completely wrong. You'll probably have some glitches, you'll have some glitches. But definitely try to build a model in your head for the paper. Yes? How do you work with the map in the paper? Because there are a lot of groups which. It's a very good point. A very good point. There are a lot of proofs which you need a background. And the the thing I often tell my students is the following. Let me see if I can find a Okay. So this is gonna be a bit tricky because A we've got two minutes left and B this has rotation in it. So let's look at this theorem. There's a theorem here. It says something very cryptic, right? And it has a big proof. You're like, I have no idea what this proof is. And my first recommendation to you would be, when you're looking at a theorem of this kind, don't read the proof. In fact, translate the theorem into English in your head. And so for this theorem, again, there's a lot of rotation here, so it's not going to be clear to you what to say. For any P, P is a point set, one of the two properties must hold. It has a woody do widget or it has a bloody la plus one. <coughs> so yes, so the theorem is saying one of two things must hold for a point set. Okay, good. Now what is it? This has a blah 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 ring separator. So it's got some. So I, I have to go back and look at the definition of a ring separator here, and I can write it down. So it has it has some. Well, I know this thing. It's got some shape. So you have to, if you go back and look at the definition, not the proof, just the definition, it'll tell you what that shape is. It's this particular kind of uh, way of dividing the rings. Or it claims this, which also is a definition, as a definition of a gamma delta cluster. It has this. Do not read the proof. See what it's telling you. It's saying either it has a shape that looks like this or it has a shape that looks like that. That's clearly going to be useful. And you might want to think about why that might be useful. It might be something that seems reasonable, and you might think about why that's reasonable. If neither of those things make any sense, then go. We'll but the proof is, in some sense, the last thing you should look at. A theorem will have some intrinsic meaning to it, and that's what's important to, to push the argument forward. And the proof validates that it's correct. Sometimes the proof tells you why it's correct, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there's a better way to understand the theorem without looking at it. And so that's one way, that's, that's how I like to read papers in, in, in more, with more mathematical content. I skip all the proofs. And I try to, I mean, at this point, I can kind of half prove a theorem in my head. So I can kind of half say, okay, this is kind of how it must work. Then I can go to the proofs and say, okay, that's wrong. But it was kind of okay, and that's good enough for me. You, 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 you have to live with this level of, of sort of control of it until <laughs> things collapse into some kind of sense. Good. Any other? I think I have one more question for we, for we keep it. Okay, so again, I would like to know, and you can send me an email privately or whatever, uh, if this was useful to you. Because if it's not, what would be useful? I'd like to know.